Uh, g'day campers, how are you? And welcome back to another one on one campfire project. And I am being a little bit cheeky and reintroducing Jack Levi. G'day Jack, how are you, mate? Very well, mate, very well. As Elliot Goblet would say, um, it's great to be inside your screen. That's what he would say, yeah. <laughs> well, that's on point right there because tonight I'm really chuffed because you and I have spent a little bit of time together lately and the majority of the world knows you as Elliot Goblet. I'm learning yep. Jack Levi and I'm very privileged to do that because you and I have been talking about a lot of things lately and a lot of things life. So today I'm really looking forward to opening you up a little bit to our community so people can see the heart behind Jack Levi because I tell you what, mate, it's been a very, very good and quick connection that we've made and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. So thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure, Scott. No, oh, brilliant. Well, if I'm going to be a little bit cheeky, I'm going to start off with, where did you grow up? Sorry, what was that again? Where did you grow up? Okay, I grew up in, well, my first five years of my life were in Paran and then moved to Hawthorne. I lived there between the ages of five and 20 and then moved to Caulfield. And then Caulfield, from, from Caulfield to Elwood, to Caulfield to Elwood. Bit of a yo-yo, really, between those two suburbs. But I've been in this house for a fair while. I'm loving, I'm a, I'm a block from the beach and just loving the area of Elwood. Yeah, beautiful. It's a beautiful place, Melbourne, also. And it's just, mm. I'll tell you what, it's an amazing place. So, oh, yeah. where best did you go? Sorry? Where did, it, where did I? Where did you go to school? Uh, I went to Auburn Central and then went to Camwell High. And Camwell High, of course, is where Kylie Minogue and Danny Minogue went to, and uh, Peter Knights, the ex player and coach, and people like uh, Brian Naylor went to Camwell High. Um, so a few famous, but Mick Conway, who used to be the lead of Captain Matchbox. Um, so we've had a few interesting people that come out of Camwell High, but um, yeah, great school. And I still have catch up with old students every now and again for reunions, and that's a lot of fun. I haven't changed at all, but they all have. <laughs> I love the people around to change. <laughs> yeah, they've all changed. Recon unrecognisable, yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So growing up in Melbourne, what was it like? Growing up in Melbourne? Yeah. Uh, terrific, yeah. I mean, the days before lockdown, Melbourne was just wonderful. Um, um, no, I, I loved it. I particularly loved the time I spent in Hawthorne because um, I was not far away from the Glen Ferry Oval and I used to hear the roar of the crowds and... Uh, so it wasn't long after I moved there that I, my curiosity took me to the ground to watch Hawthorne play AFL football or VFL football in those days, and I just got hooked. It became a real addiction for me from the age of 12 onwards. And, um, yeah, that made a big of a, bit of a difference to my life, something really to look forward to on, on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah, I know you're an avid, avid uh, a fan of the AFL. Who's your favourite player? I really haven't got a favourite player, I've got to say. Um, Luke Hodge was when he was playing for Hawthorne. Uh, a remarkable man, Luke Hodge. Great leader, a great player. Um, so uh, he was. But when I was a kid, I used to wear, and this is a long time ago, I used to wear John Peck's number on the back on my back, 23, because he, he used to kick five goals and I used to, you know, in a match, and I thought that was a lot until I started watching Peter Hudson, who... Uh, used to kick sometimes between 14 and 17 goals. So he is an amazing man, Peter Hudson. Yeah. But I'm going What's on a best? bit there. No, but that's perfect because that's what it's about, right? It's about mm -hmm. you and the members you have because you've got a lifetime worth of opportunities that I'm hoping to draw out tonight. Because yeah, I want to sure. know the man. Want to know the man behind Jack Levi because I'm very privileged to. Just enjoy you and rather than that goblet because some of the stuff you do behind the scenes, which we'll get into in a little bit, is just phenomenal. I'm, I'm looking forward 
for sharing that. So Hawthorne's your club. What's your favourite memory from the Hawthorne Football Club? Oh, I think the first premiership that I saw back in 1971, that was a real thrill. Um, very memorable. Uh, but just so many memories, but that, that is a bit of a standout to... And I celebrated for days, i got to say. <laughs> and I kind of took it, <laughs> I took it for granted that Hawthorne were winning premierships because they actually won a lot. I, I saw them win 12 of their 13. And, uh, in fact, they won three in a row in 2013, 14 and 15. And I and they missed out in 2016. And I thought, well, I'm disappointed because I was just expecting Hawthorne to win the premiership every year at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I know, absolute powerhouse there. Like they had... Around yeah. the pub, it was amazing. I was I was lucky enough to um, run into Ian Dick and have a bit of a chat with him, and I read his book on his time at the Hawthorne Football Club and how he put the club together. And it was just well, beautiful. yeah, he came in and uh, to say or to be a, a very um, prominent figure in saving Hawthorne from merging with Melbourne in 1996 and. Uh, and I also participated in that, working closely with Don Scott. So we we really turned things around for the Hawks. Don, Don Scott had to be there to lead it, but there are a lot of contributors. Wow, I didn't know that. She had that time. Yeah. Hey, yeah. What was your experience there? Well, in 1996, I was pretty hot as Elliot Goblet on TV. And... and um, and I was called. I I was called on to because being an ardent Hawk supporter to participate in trying to save Hawthorne from merging with Melbourne. So, um, in fact, at Glenfree Oval, this is a very memorable. Don Scott, Dermot Brereton, Steve Quartermain, and myself spoke to the crowds at Glenfree Oval, and it was a bit weird for me because I was talking and not expecting laughs. I was just talking. It was a very strange time, but because of my high profile, I got all these interviews in the press and radio. Um, you know, the man, uh, Jack Levi, a.k.a. Elliot Goblet, um, who's participating in Saving Hawthorne Merge from with Melbourne. And it got me a lot of exposure that I otherwise wouldn't have got if I didn't have a public profile. Yeah. Great times. I remember getting yeah. round and gold shoes made for that period. Yeah. That's brilliant. Because it, it was a, a telling time in, in AFL history where... You know, Melbourne, the great clubs of Melbourne, Hawthorne and Melbourne were coming to try to merge them because they could, the financially they were struggling and just the way in which you drummed up support from the grassroots and they just got behind everybody. Yeah, we all contributed. Don Scott, well, like I said, was the leader, but we all contributed in our way. I, together with another guy called Simon Rogers, put together a huge comment or a great variety show at the Athenaeum Theatre, and that raised a good amount of money, which just added to the pot. We, we, it was Operation Payback. We had to come up with a lot of money to, um, to say, hey, you know, to reverse a dreadful. Um, financial problem that Hawthorne had. So we had to come up with all that money. We came up with the money, then we voted against the merge. Melbourne voted for the merge, but because one club club's members voted against the merge, it didn't happen. But um, it was a great time. Actually, it was the first time I actually got involved with a cause other than uh, not related to myself, you know. It was, yeah. it, it was very inspiring to be involved in a team trying to do something which was going to benefit the community in a huge way. Well, yeah. I reckon there's a couple of lessons I could probably look back into with that and probably take into right now, you know, because of the way in which the people rallied together to make it happen was just beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Looking back on that time, is, is there anything that you could see that you think would help right now? Sorry again, Scott. So looking back on that time when the merger was happening and everybody dug deep, is there anything, any lessons from that time that you can really apply right now? Yeah, I think so. Um, 
a community of people who have passion can actually make a difference. Yeah, because it was a, a fait accompli, I was told, that Hawthorne and Melbourne were going to merge. That's because a lot of money was being handed out to the uh, to the boards of uh, the clubs and it was a, a huge carrot for them to, to vote on a merge. But the passion of the people overturned that. So the financial potential financial gains of very few did not eventuate because of the passionate actions of very many. Yeah. There's, there's definitely a lesson right now. I can fucking I can feel that. Yeah. Because you're you're a passionate man, and it's, yeah, it's something you wear your heart on your sleeve like in the public eye. And I just I'd like to open that up a little bit because growing up, you know, like you grew up with your mum and your dad. And if you'd like to, how how you grew up, that'd be amazing. Yeah, it was a, an unhappy household, i got to say. Mum and Dad fought a lot. Um, so when they broke up in 1970, I was very relieved. I thought those two people were better off apart. And, and, that, and, that, and that was great. It was, it was very liberating for Mum because she was uh, the victim of a lot of uh, verbal abuse, really. So uh, it was just so liberating. And my brother Ed and myself moved with Mum in her flat in Caulfield, and she's still there at the age of 97. She is still there. Amazing lady. Um, and the relationship was, with Dad was better because he, he he wasn't irritating the hell out of us. He was on his own, which is what he should have been doing uh, a few years prior to, to when they broke up. Yeah. Hmm. There's a bit so, of yeah, that so I didn't have Sorry, Scott. No, so there's a little bit of that too, you know, with the current opportunity that is, COVID, you know, a lot of people have, are struggling to stay together. You know, yes, I don't think. Yes, and I don't think COVID has helped. There's been a lot of arguments yeah, behind closed doors. You know, there's, um, you know, people are disagreeing on on things like vaccinations and wearing masks and their attitudes towards the current Victorian government, for example, in this state. So. These arguments that are happening between couples and families behind closed doors weren't weren't so prevalent before. Yeah. yeah. But I do I do like the fact and just hearing the fact that as a child you felt better with them apart and and you saw your mum blossom because of that. That's right, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And and I think mum having those tough years um, in the kind of last five years with Dad, um, felt so liberated. Um, she is just a really, she's a really happy 97-year-old because she got out of what she felt was a prison uh, back in 1970 and just loves every day of her freedom. Yeah. Yep. I, I tell you what, she's got some weird bit too, but I do remember her seeing her live on stage and just... Yeah. Owning the stage, I just, I can see a little bit of where you get it from. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. I mean, her sense of humour and mine are a bit different, but she, uh, yeah, she did a three-minute routine about the men in her life and a bit of a play on words and how she loved to go to bed with a uh, with Johnny Walker and uh, Napoleon Brandy. So a great little routine she had and, uh, and loves getting up on stage. So it's a bit like me, you know, that need to perform. It's not just the ability to perform, but the need to perform that gets you up on stage behind a microphone. And, you know, you know, I think there's a lot of funny people in Australia, but they just haven't got the need to perform and get up on stage in front of a group of strangers. And that's what can, I guess, distinguishes comedians from the multitude of funny Australians. I like that, the need to get mm. up on stage. Can we unpack mm. that? You can, you can borrow it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's uh, comedians, when you look at them, um, they have to have a need to get up on stage. Otherwise, you wouldn't do that. It's a crazy way to, uh, to make a living, isn't it? You know, getting behind a microphone and saying, look at me, laugh at me, clap me. It's, um, it's that, you know, it's a bit of a cry for attention, I guess. Or um, in Woody, Allen, Woody Allen's case, he wanted to belittle himself, demean himself, I guess, or 
um, before others did because they used to do that at school. He'd be picked on and he thought, well, I'm going to get up and make fun of myself before other people do. Mm -hmm. So there's the reasons why people... Sorry. Not a bad way to go about it. Yeah, it's a pretty effective way. (laughs) Yeah. So talking about comedians getting on stage, like during COVID, you and I have had a few conversations about comedians they're not having a great time. No, no. Um, a lot of comedians are depressed and anxious anyway, and then you add COVID on top of that, and some of them uh, are having real problems right now. I think, um, look, if, if you if you are what you do, then when you don't, you're not, you know, and that's an expression I've heard before, but it's a beauty. So... Say comedians that don't have much else apart from being on stage and saying, look at me, and if they, for example, have to undergo a period of not being able to entertain, as we had with COVID, they get very, they feel very worthless. Their self-esteem is the issue. They don't have the strong self-esteem. They've got the ego, haven't got the strong self-esteem and just feel useless when they can't get up behind a microphone and say, look at me. Yeah. Tough place to be in right now, especially if you're working out of Melbourne because the opportunities just have not been there. The opportunities to get out to other places haven't been there either. That's right, exactly. And look, and I'm resilient. I'm more resilient than a lot of other comedians and uh, I was somebody that others could lean on rather than me leaning on others, which is which is great. I, I felt quite empowered by that, actually ringing people up, normal people and people entertainers and just ask them how they were going. I did a lot of it, particularly the, during the long lockdown of last year, and uh, it helped them, help me. Yeah, I love that because that's very much what I'm about and that's one of the things I'm looking forward to talking to, so I may as well talk about it now because that phone call of just picking up the phone and saying, hey, how are you? Like, it's been so important and mm. I, I know you do it well. What's it been like over the last 18 months in that scenario? Um, good and bad. A lot of positives out of COVID. Negative, a lot of negatives too. But yeah, good and bad. I think you use the word. It's a great reset. I think that's a wonderful term, Scott. Um, it's actually made people get to know themselves better, get to know their relationships with other people better. Um, work out whether they're tolerant or intolerant. Uh, it it gives people an idea of you know. Um, how short their fuse is, um, how, much, how dependent they are in work to working, and what else they've got in their lives. Um, yeah, it, it's just a real eye opener this period of time. Yeah, mm. yeah, I like that because it's what else you've got in your lives. Like it's yeah, the people I see that are not necessarily doing great but doing okay are those that have different things in their life so they can adapt with the situations. They're not held to just one situation, i.e. like the comedians that are just, you know, they only perform outside of that. They don't have much else. So it's it's a tough place to get out of. So having those different things to do, like just picking up a phone and saying, hey, mate, how are you? That's, that's a thing to do, right? It is picking up the phone and saying how are you, but really meaning it and having the time to listen to people, not just doing it because you want to tick another name off your list, you know. So that that's important. Um, sometimes I had to call people twice to get them to call me back. Um, there's a couple of people that never got back to me, so I think they're doing it particularly tough. And I just hope they've got good family and good friends around them. That's all. Um, but um, I had a train of thought there, and I'm just trying to pick it up again was something you said there that triggered me and I just, yeah, but having other things in your life is really important. Um, having a good family and close friends is really important because if you say a, a comedian that is just a gypsy and always away and didn't really um, give much priority to a family or friends, then... Um, that period would have been particularly hard because you would have been calling, maybe calling on people uh, for a bit of help that you may have ignored for years. 
So, you know, you've got to be kind to the people on the way up because you'll probably need them on the way down. Yeah, 100%. Mm. And that's, look, at the end of the day, once you get to the top, there is only one way. You know? And it's, it's really important that you've got the support at that point. Yeah, yeah. I really value so, my old friends. Yeah, go on, Scott. Yeah. Well, no, no, sorry. It's <laughs> a lot of this opportunity. Um, so, what do you reckon your biggest learnings been? What's the one thing that really stood out for you? Uh, over COVID, over COVID period, mm. or, or in my life? Over COVID period. Yeah. Oh, the need to be resilient. You know, two people got the same circumstances in their lives and one will be uh, depressed, anxious, and the other one may be happy um, and optimistic that they're going to get out of this and, you know, see the glass half full, whereas the other person might see the glass half empty and it really affects your health. As you get stressed, you hide away. Um, if you, say seeing the glass half empty, it's so easy to resort to the Band-Aids. Um, Scott, you know, the, the booze, the drugs, the online gambling, um, excessive television watching. It's easy to escape from your reality if you don't like your reality. You know, during the lockdown, I, I still like my reality. And, you know, I might have had a sip of wine for five nights a week, but you know, two two glasses of wine maybe tops. I didn't knock myself out. Don't take drugs. A little bit of uh, harmless online gambling because it was for me it was entertainment. Harmless, just a little little bit of money that I could absolutely afford. And um, you know you, you just got to watch out for the band aids because there's too much too many people are using band aids to to and and. Um, and artificial painkillers like well, as the escapes I mentioned, you know, instead of just grappling with reality and trying to improve yourself, you know, maybe do a course or read some great books. For example, if you feel you've got a self-esteem problem, there's a wonderful book called Self-Esteem, you know, which would have been, and a lot of people would have had time to, to read books like that instead of just watching, um, you know, TV all the time. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And it's like the band because I, I, I personally like to call it the Botoxing of life, where you just put fillers in to hide what mm. life is actually giving you. So it's just, it's it's interesting because those that I personally know who have thrived through this opportunity have gone down the personal development track where they've gone and studied something, they've gone and learned something, they've been a part of something new in order to keep themselves not occupied, but growing. You read the Queen mm. growing and you're and growing. And that's one of the, the, the beautiful things. And you and I have spoken before about personal development. And you did you did a personal development course years ago. And if I remember correctly, that's one of the greatest things you personally done for yourself. Yes, in 1998, I was uh, particularly depressed. Um, a relationship breakup brought that on and um, I went to see a counsellor and also I read books that she prescribed and went on a course that she um, recommended and um, and that that was really helpful the, the the combination of all that was really helpful um, and it, it it strengthened me but an extra thing I did really capped it off I was on an aeroplane in the year 2000 um, on the way to Sydney from Melbourne and I read an article about uh, Les Twentyman who uh, had just brought out a book, his first book, and I thought to myself, I'm doing everything else for me that I need to do. And the other thing I need to do is do something for the community. So I'd met Les a couple of times, got in touch with him, suggested we put on a huge comedy show at some venue had a meeting and we 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 did a phenomenal event. We we grabbed we had Crown Showroom at uh, it's now called the Palms at Crown Casino. Uh, we met with them and with the contacts that Les had and I had, we got Crown Showroom to give us a free room or Crown to give us the free showroom. 
we got 3AW, the Herald Sun, to be sponsors, and Channel 9 as well to film the event, put it on TV. So we had all the help in the world. We filled the room, 1,100 people. And that was the start of five years of doing the same. So five years of doing called Comedians for a Cause. And I was on three of those shows out of the five years, but I was the talent coordinator for all five years. And by having such a big part in uh, in putting on those shows and being able to watch how much money we were able to make for a wonderful cause, uh, Lee's Twentyman and Father Bob were with Open Family at the time. And um, the two men I regard very highly, they split from Open Family a bit later after that five years of shows and they've got their own foundations now. And as it happens, I've rejoined forces with Les Twentyman, Les Twentyman Foundation. We're going to put on a big show, similar show at the Palms at Crown on February 27, 2022. Uh, so we, we're going back to the past. Mm. I, I, I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to open up with Bob through you and be involved in a couple of things with him. He's been one of the greatest opportunities that he doesn't even realise he gave me. It was a gift to actually speak to the kids at Axia Centre in Ward Meadows. I was just, I'm forever grateful that I got to meet these young kids, in particular Tyler, um, that just, just got straight into my heart. But mm. being involved with those guys and actually making a difference, not talking yeah. about it, actually making a difference. It's a whole new level of heart. It is, mate. It's so good for you to make a difference. And I'm in the position where I can, you know. I've got I've got power. I've got I've got nine and a half thousand LinkedIn connections and nearly four thousand friends on Facebook. So I, I and people uh, see me as a credible person. So if I mention something like that Les Twentyman Foundation fundraiser, the comedians for a cause, a lot of people I know buy tickets as they already have lockdown stop the, the sales of those tickets, but they're going to resume again soon. But yeah, I can make a difference uh, by helping the helpers. See, I, I during lockdown, I felt so sorry for a lot of people who were doing it tough. And I thought, I can't really get out there properly and talk to people in the street, but I can help somebody like the Les Twentyman Foundation put on more youth workers so that more youth workers can get out there and talk to people in the street. I mean, a couple of things that the Les Twentyman Foundation does is uh, buying school books for kids who can't afford it and putting kids into sporting teams, sports teams. So instead of these kids gravitating towards gangs, they actually gravitate towards a sports team and they have a, a healthy peer group. That, you know, so he saved, they've saved a lot of lives by people actually having a purpose in life instead of, you know, just being rolling around the streets, being a pest. Mm. Yeah. I love that. I really do because I know the difference it makes when you light a kid's eyes up and you give them an opportunity. You know, life mm. doesn't always give kids opportunities, but if you can give them a mentor and in, in a sporting club or inside a community event, it just mm. you never know what you can do because at the end of the day, we're all part of one bigger community. We're all part of an organism called life. So if we don't support the people that need the support, they can impact our lives at any moment if they're not having a great day. So it's really yep. important to support them so that they do get an opportunity because that's where we go together. That's when we become human. Hmm. You know, and yep, I and, and yeah. Yeah, and, and look, so many, unfortunately, so many kids uh, have dysfunctional families, you know. Um, a lot of boys don't have good male role models, for example, and, you know. So that's where that's where you, you need outsider people to come in and, and replace, um, you know, a, a substitute good for bad. Mm, you do. Yeah, 100%. Like, and, it's, mm. and it's funny because I spent a bit of time with uh, men that are having a fair bit of trouble and inside a lot of those conversations those guys just haven't had a haven't had a positive role model inside their life and mm. unfortunately people 
have been lumbered with pain. A lot of it's generational and mm. they haven't processed it. Therefore, they get stuck with the next generation. And the only way we need to, we can lift that is by going and sit, sitting with them and giving them an opportunity, giving them an opportunity to grow. Because one of the things for me, I don't know anybody who has an athlete is my life, you know, and I love that because I've always seen an opportunity in people, good or bad, that it just adds value to me because oh, I'm able to spend that time with them. And I'm just so grateful for that because nobody ever makes a decision to be wrong. Yeah, they only make yeah. a decision to, to what's right for them in that moment. They might learn later that it's a pretty bad decision, but that was the right decision for them at that time. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made it. So yeah. I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump along a little bit because I just want to ask a couple of questions and then we'll dive back into it, but. What has been your biggest learning thus far, both as a comedian and as a human being? We'll start with comedian. Start with uh, as a comedian? Yep. As a comedian, oh, the need to be sensitive but but also resilient. There's a bit of a, there's a, a nice mix there. Um, the... Um, the the need to get on with people. It's not a matter of just performing. You need to talk to the stage manager and be kind to the lighting guy, the sound guy, whatever the lighting woman, the sound woman, um, and be kind to other comedians and mentor younger comedians. You know, just help them, give them a give them a suggestion. So help others. It's not just about you; it's about others as well. Um, not get ahead of yourself. Like I had a meteoric rise on TV, but I started at an age where I was mature. I'd been out in the real world for a while. So because I was, I, I'd gone past a lot of other comedians. After 10 months of being in the industry, I, I was getting regular uh, variety show exposure. So, you know, I did eight shows on the Daryl Summer Show back in 1982 in a year and a half. And then I went on to Hey Hey. So I, I kind of went past comedians, but I, I retained uh, humility. You know, I didn't, I didn't start putting people down just because I'd gone past them in the fame area. Um, I yeah, I respect great comedians, but I won't I won't belittle comedians that I don't rate. They're still people. They they appeal to a certain community, but um, you just got to be tolerant, and understanding. Um, I've got good emotional intelligence, which helps. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a, there's a few things there. I've kind of gone a bit of a scattered way, but I'm, I'm kind of getting out mostly what I think is important for a comedian. Uh, originality really has helped me. That's what made me break through. You know, I started at a time when the comedy scene was very rich. The comedy variety cabaret scene was very rich in the late seventies, early eighties. And when I started in the later, in the early eighties, I had to do something that was different. I really needed to because there was some great acts around and for me to break through the clutter, I had to do something different. And, and that's why I, I was fortunate enough to come up with this deadpan character with his weird idiosyncrasies and that really broke through the clutter. And uh, Daryl Summers picked me up and I'm very grateful to that man and his team. Uh, and you have that, yeah. and I know they're deep in your heart too, the boys, because... The, the joy that you got from the reunion the other day, that would have been beautiful. Yeah, it was great to be on that special the other night. Uh, hey, hey, it's 50 years because they did use, I think, hundreds of comedians on the show to entertain and they only picked about five of us, um, showed uh, a bit of our act of five of us. So I was I was very, I, I thought I deserved to be there because I'd done about 21 uh, hey, hey's. But it was just nice to be picked with in the company of acts like Lane Owen Woodley and the amazing Jonathan, and of course Russell Gilbert. They they show they did a, a fantastic tribute to Russell, um, a beautiful segment on Russell Gilbert, which was one of the highlights of the show. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Like, I think that's actually where I was introduced to you, and that's probably one of the very few early memories I have with my father sitting with him watching you on Hey Hey. So that's... <laughs> and he was laughing. 
<laughs> Sorry. And he was laughing and you were wondering what he was laughing at. A lot of kids have that. They, <laughs> their parents laughing and say, look at look at me on TV. And they, and they just don't get it. They're very young kids, but they see their parents laughing and then they get it as they get older. And they've mentioned that. A lot of kids have mentioned that to me that, you know, they haven't seen their father laugh and, as much as when he saw me on the box and, you know, and, they, and that impacted them and, and, and intrigued them, I guess, to find out what in the hell I was on about. Yeah, very much so, because you're just emotionless and then people were laughing. Like, where was yeah. the idea of compute as a kid? Because you were sitting there watching the TV and there's there's nothing mm -hmm. from you and yet the parents are laughing. It's like it yeah. doesn't compute. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Where's the where's the slapstick? Where's the the crazy yeah. face? Where's the antics? And he's just going on, just talking like a like a robot. He's catatonic. And yeah. So. But that that's what worked for me really. Being, uh, I guess you could say, um, um, understated in manner, but overstated in matter. You know, yeah. I talk about going internally berserk, or you know, going numb with joy. I talk about those things, and yet when you look at the Elliot Goblet character, he's nothing like that. So the the, <laughs> the contrast worked for me. The contrast, yeah, mm. yeah. Well, there was a significant contrast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, give me up, Borgers. Oh, you know, let's put a smile on face, taking me back there. You know, so uh, I appreciate that. And thank you for sharing that. That's so, okay, mate. What are your biggest learnings as a human being? Because as much as Elliot Goblet's done some fantastic work and I've enjoyed seeing a fair bit of that, but you as a human being stand head and shoulders above most for me and I just I really appreciate that. So I'd really love for you to share with us some of your biggest learnings. Um, well, life has really taught me um, the need to be resilient, the... Uh, the need to help others and how it helps them and it helps you at the same time. Um, and you know that well, Scott, because you've been very helpful towards others, extremely helpful. So you know how much that helps you as it helps them. Um, try and get on with people. Um, try and look at the, the good qualities of people. Uh, like, I, you know, I disagree with certain people on certain things, but I ignore or I, I avoid talking about those things. So try and find the positives in people and compliment them. Um, be tolerant. Um, keep learning. I mean, I've read so many books on on self improvement, uh, books on self esteem, intimacy, and solitude, uh, on relationships. Um, yeah, great books that I've read. Um, I've met some wonderful people. Um, Oh, just uh, uh, life has taught me. I mean, my mum's a great teacher too and the way she lives her life um, with her happy longevity. And she's 97 and she's one of the happiest people around because she just cherishes every day, you know. She doesn't moan and groan about ailments that she's got. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's um, not, not, you know, not being too... Overconfident, being confident but not overconfident, and, and um, yeah, helping people where you can, and being honest. I think that's the important thing. I, I just don't. I'm not into lying, and that's why politicians let me down so often. There's very few that are straight shooters. Others are just um, they're part of a team, and they've got to uh, they've got to abide by the rules of the team, and they lose themselves. Unfortunately, you know, if I was in politics, which I won't, but if I was, I'd be an independent, so I could speak my mind. Yeah. Mm. And okay. share, you know, share what I can. I, I'm pretty social and I I have events where I get people together and I, I enjoy doing that. So I'm in, really happy about introducing good people to good people. I've done so much of that. I've done a bit of that with you too, Scott. I introduced you to some good people in the short time I've known you. And I get a kick out of that. Yeah. In fact, a good person brought you to a, my... A cabaret show and that's how I met you because a good person brought you you know yeah and introduced us and I, love, I love that about you because you do fill your life with people you fill your life with good people and you share the good people and I I, I think that's the thing that I've found 
for, for lack of better words, attractive about you is the fact that you do surround yourself in the goodness, but you make sure that those goodness, that goodness is actually shared with us so that it continues. Because I think my personal journey thus far, that's been the gift that I've been able to enjoy, is that, con that continual fuel, because it's like you fuel each other up. You make each other stronger because you're giving each other the soul yeah. and the heart from each other. It's just beautiful. Yeah, but also don't ignore bad people. I'd never turn your back on anybody. I, that's a, a thing I'd, I've got. And, and I've never unfriended anybody on Facebook. I've been irritated by a couple of people in particular. Um, but I, I've actually argued with them on, you know, via messenger or in one case I called the guy. And, uh, yeah, I'd rather confront people and talk through things with them because you never know. You unfriend someone, they could self-harm. That might might be the last thing that, that just tipped them over the edge. So, you know, just just uh, try and get down to the bottom of why people are like they are. Um, you know, just try and find out what it is. Talk to talk talk them through. Talk through with them. Uh, why are they so hostile towards me? Because you know I'm a likable guy, but a couple of people have been hostile towards me, and I found out why, and talked them through it. Yeah. I think that's some of the best advice that you could hear. Being, being in the situation that I, I'm in, being offended is a great opportunity to learn. And mm. when you get curious about it and you just ask for explanation, you learn how to communicate through that, you both grow through that situation. And I actually think yep. that's some of the best advice bar none because a problem is not the problem. I can respond to the problem there because the pain will lessen the opportunity. We get to choose if we're brave enough to find a lesson. If we're, and then if we're brave enough to set the responsibility to find the opportunity, it's phenomenal. Otherwise, you're left with the pain. And I think, I think that statement which you've just brought forward is the key to a full heart. Yeah. Because you don't have that resting in the back of your mind. You've got you've got a conclusion, but more importantly, nine out of ten times you've got growth that comes out of that from both of you. You're willing to mm. step into that into that conversation. Exactly. Yep. You know? mm. Which is funny because it's just reminded me I need to have a conversation. <laughs> you need to have a what? I need to have a conversation with somebody who saw my view differently and I'm like, I'll just sit on that for a little bit and yep, yep. it's time now to bring it up because you don't have to address it straight away. Just let it settle a little bit and then open it up with a different set of eyes. But that's that's me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pauses well, are strong, you know, a little bit of space is good. You know, you have a think about it and then address it properly. I think I think pausing is, pauses are very strong if you use them properly. Mm. Yeah. I completely I think it's the, the, mm. the key to any good hard conversation is actually mm. space to compute what you've just taken in and understand that and then go back to it with a little less emotion a bit more open around the situation which is just mm. brilliant yeah a lot of people get relationships wrong at the start too they meet someone and they don't give them space you know they, the guy that's a bit keen on a woman for example might might text her and then he'll he doesn't get a response and he panics and he'll text her again and again and again, six texts in a row. And it's just, you know, that's the spaces of what are really needed, not the not the cramming somebody and smothering them. But so, you know, pauses are the way to go. Yeah. Anyway, that that's about relationships. And I'm, I'm interested in relationships and people's relationships. And I, you know, I, I, I have, am a bit of a mentor for some of my younger friends, you know. I go out with them and I see them and I can actually comment, give them constructive criticism, say, well, I wouldn't have done that or I wouldn't have said that or I'd do that differently. And and they listen to me because I'm a bit older and I'm a bit wiser. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm slightly hard right now because I know something about you that um, many people wouldn't, you would probably make a brilliant relationship coach. <laughs> I reckon I would, mate, yeah. <laughs> I would. Yeah. Listen, just in case you it doesn't take off i'll help you out with that becoming a coach all right just in case <laughs> okay. i'll run to you to 
mentor me as I want to mentor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the mentor, the mentor. Yeah, okay. Mentor, the mentors. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's just on that mentor and the mentors, one of the things at the moment is, you know, supporting the support. And I think that's something that mm. we've done quite well because so often the supporters are the ones that stand strong consistently and no one actually asks if they're okay. And I think that's yeah. what you do. You check in and make sure they're okay. So, mm. I, um, yeah. I'm just looking at the time and I, I really... Vegas, more importantly, I, I want to want to make sure that people watch this because I, as I've said four times already, I'm very grateful to know you as a man because I, I, I think you're fantastic and I wish more people in the world would take on more of your heart because it's, it's something to me that has really stood out. So thank you for being you. Thank you, mate. Appreciate what you've done for me and what you're doing for people in general. I think it's fantastic. Good on you, Scott. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'll leave you with one question for you to answer, if that's all right. Yep. Depends how tough that is. <laughs> oh, it'll, be, it'll be pretty tough. I won't, be, I won't let you off too easy. <laughs> if there was one thing just one thing you could say to a young bloke starting in life it's just having just left school and it's just having a crack at life mm. what's that one bit of advice you would give him oh one of them would be find your passion and follow it another one would be believe in yourself and yeah, work on your self-esteem and there's a couple of things really self-esteem is really important and following your your passion is another one there's a couple of things there, but there's a few others, but I think they stand out as the two for me. Brilliant. Mm. How you make, just, make, just, make, make happiness a goal. I think that's been said before. Make happiness a goal. Yeah. yeah. Back to you. You can choose it. <laughs> no, you can yeah. choose happiness. Yeah. You can. <laughs> you know, like I, 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 I live. <laughs> so, yeah. That's a, yeah. Jack, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on today and just being you. And you're already a part of our project, and I know you've done a, uh, an interview earlier, but I'm really looking forward to people listening to this and, and, and hearing you as a man. Thank you for coming on today. Thanks, Scott. Bye, mate. See ya. All right. Take care, campus. Thank you for working one on one. This is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, Jump on, do a one-on-one, -on -one. let us know who you are and what you're doing because we're all amazing people and when we share our stories, it's a beautiful place. But thanks, guys. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Scott. Good on you, mate. Thank you. Okay, we're off. Bye.